Welcome back. This is another episode of Dentists Who Invest official podcast. This is a little bit of an unusual podcast today. Unusual in so far as it's just me. It's just solo. There is no other guest. It's just myself speaking down the microphone on a few things that I have learned throughout the last three years and through maybe this last year as well. Haven't we all learned an absolute ton over the last year? Uh, things that I think that would be helpful to share with others, things that perhaps that I've said on other podcasts, things that I've talked about with some of the guests that have come on the show, but maybe they're just not all under one roof. Maybe this is the distilling of all the best pieces of information, tips and tricks that I have learned through, through doing the podcast, through creating the group, through speaking to all the people that I have and things that I knew already. Nice to have them all in one place so that it is nice and convenient for everybody to listen to. And those who may not necessarily have heard them before, it's quite accessible to them as well. And that's why I wanted to do this. I've been meaning to do it for a little while. As it happens over the Christmas period, people are a little bit, podcast guests are a little bit more hard to come by, which is totally understandable, of course. I think it's partly because I haven't been attempting to get as many guests on. I'm trying to be respectful of people's Christmas holidays. It's a nice time as well for me to speak. It's pertinent in so far as it's a nice time of year. It's a year that we're looking back, we're reflecting on 2020, we're looking forward to 2021. A lot of people will be turning over a new, you know, a new leaf in the new year. It's a new year, new me, that's the cliche. And it comes at a time of reflection. It comes at a time where I think that if we are, well, we're certainly more receptive to positive change in our life and maybe some of these things that I'm about to speak on a little bit in this episode it's a good time to enact them and I think it would be helpful to hear them and also interesting for me to just put it all down and just I, I always have fun making these I learn a lot even if it's things that I already knew I refresh myself so it's just great to be able to put this all in one place and hopefully it will be of use to those listening and definitely I've learned a little bit by reflecting on things as well. So without further ado, let's delve into the content of this to this co podcast. We're gonna talk about investing, we're gonna talk about things that I've learned, things that I've learned about social media. And at the end, I wanna talk a little bit about what I'm expecting, where I'm expecting the group to go in the new year, where I am expecting the podcast to go. And as well as that, just some reflections on general investing and maybe a little bit on Bitcoin chucked in there as well. First and foremost, something that I could have benefited from hearing a long time ago. Now, this might sound obvious. A lot of people out there will have already thought of this. Whatever stage they're at of their investment journey, it's probably the very first thing that you'll think of, but it's maybe something that I hadn't really ever had articulated to me before, uh, before I started investing. I definitely think it would be a useful thing to hear, and that is, what is your plan for investing? Now that might sound obvious. A lot of people will say, well, my plan is to get rich, of course, but what is wealth? What is richness? What does that look like for you? It might look different to how it looks for me and so on and so forth to the next person, the person after that and what have you. Whether you're investing or trading, I've come to learn that a plan gives you something that you can objectively measure your successes by. Even if you don't hit that very zenith, that objective of where you want to be, at least you'll have a roadmap on a series of events that you can measure your progression by, which is incredibly helpful. And it motivates you, it drives you to continue, and it lets you know as well you're on the right path. So when I say a plan, what do I mean? So let's split down investing, investing and trading. Let's split them separately just for a moment. We'll talk purely on investing. Luke Hurley was on the podcast not so long ago. He spoke of something really interesting, and that was what is our long-term goal for our investing portfolio? Is it retirement or is it financial freedom? And those are two separate things, actually. There's a gray area in between them, but I'll explain what I mean. Retirement is when we reach a point in our lives that we no longer work. We cease to work, we cease to work forevermore. Retirement may be your ultimate goal, it may not be. Some of us like our jobs, some of us want to continue working, and that's fine. I don't think that I would like to give up dentistry anytime soon. I feel like I'm too 
early in the game for that. I've invested so much time. I've I've not been pra- I've only been practicing four years. I've been in uni five. I mean, that's not, you know, I've got so much more to give, so much more where I want to go. I wouldn't like to retire, at least for the time being. And a lot of people will feel like that. So when we're investing and we're aiming towards retirement, is this necessarily a healthy thing or something that we want to achieve? Maybe in the very long run, possibly, who knows? But all, all I'm saying is that maybe when we when we when we think about investing in those terms and maybe it's as black and white as we're investing to retire, is that always true? Not necessarily the case. Maybe maybe you would prefer to have financial freedom. Financial freedom is the point where we no longer need to work to sustain ourselves financially. We can choose to continue working if we want, totally fine. However, we have the option, which is wonderful. Amazing time to talk about it at the end of 2020, given everything that's happened this year. Coronavirus has taught us that maybe dentistry isn't as certain, isn't as much of a guarantee in terms of a source of income as what we previously thought it was. Will we ever see a point in time again where we have this massive black swan event like coronavirus, which stops us from working, prevents us from working? Probably not. But is it sensible to have a side gig to hedge ourselves against this? That's almost certainly tr- true as well. If nothing else, from the point of view of creating a more healthy, broadened lifestyle in which you don't have to focus purely on one thing. I made the mistake of spending all my time learning about dentistry, or at least 90% of the reading I did was about dentistry uh, for many years. And I realized that when coronavirus came, that was all out the window to a degree. And it was my, my, my passion or my long-term interest in, in investing. Thank God I had that to fall back on. And maybe a lot of people weren't really in the same boat on that. And what it's taught me is it's the power of diversifying, diversifying not only in your investments, diversifying in your skills and knowledge as well. If you can do this, you're more robust as an individual, as a human, and more robust financially as well. Perhaps this is something that we all ought to think about a little bit more. And there's always room for improvement, no matter who you are, no matter what you do. Definitely, I think that that this year has highlighted how much of an issue that is, and maybe how much we didn't think about that before as dentists. I definitely could have improved, and I, I maybe then. I feel like I'm saying the obvious out loud a little bit to those listening, but hopefully there'll be someone out there who will take, will use this as an inspiration to branch out a little bit and do something else. There'll be a lot of other positives that reasons that I have benefited from starting the podcast, the group, uh, being you know being into trading crypto, being into investing. That so many amazing things that I could just never have envisaged that I would benefit from at the very beginning. And now I'm able to see those from the other side. I just think to myself, why didn't I do something like this sooner? And maybe somebody out there who's thinking about taking the plunge, I absolutely implore you to just go ahead, put yourself out there. It's so worth it. It's so, so, so worth it. But we'll come on to more on that later. The financial freedom thing, is an amazing aspiration to have when we have a goal. We don't always not want to stop working. Not all of us do. Financial freedom gives us the option not to. If we were all financially free before the start of coronavirus, we all would have had a lot less collective stress to deal with. Something to think of. Maybe that's a better ultimate end goal for your investing in finance. And when Luke spoke of that, it certainly made me reflect on what I do a little bit and made me see things from another light. And it made me realize, hey, maybe I don't necessarily want to, to use the R word, retire early. Maybe I just want to be financially free earlier and have that freedom to do whatever I want, whether that be exploring the world, whether that be more family time, whatever, it doesn't matter. All of these things are the end goal of money for me personally, is to buy back my time. It's to not be flashy, it's to not be rich. Maybe that's something that we're all indoctrinated to think a little bit, that that's the point of investing, is to get rich, to get 
so much money beyond our wildest dreams that we can have Lamborghinis, Ferraris, maybe that is your goal. But for some people out there listening, maybe that's just another interesting way of thinking of it. To have money to invest is to save money in the first place so that we have the available liquidity, funds, money to be able to do so. The glamorized part of investing is the spending of the money, is the gains that you make from investing, ridiculous gains, uh, trading futures, trading commodities, trading options, whatever. However, the less glamorous side and the more practical side is just to save the money in the first place. And this is a more healthy way of looking at it rather than being risky, I suppose. The connotation of massive amounts of risk dangerous financial practices or something that we're all indoctrinated to think along the lines of because of what we see of it in the media. It doesn't always have to be as out there as that. It can be the simple things, the small steps that you take to create more money in the first place and therefore allow that to compound and grow in the long run. A message that doesn't often get shared as much as its more glitzy counterpart and it's something that I think that is helpful to hear something that I found interesting and was another way of looking at investing. Investing flipped on its head almost when I heard it for the first time. To save money, one of the best ways that you can save money is to reduce your outgoings. We all suffer from something called lifestyle creep. When we earn more money, we inevitably spend more. We've all been there where we do it, where we think, I can have this bottle of wine over this slightly more cheaper one. You're tempted to because you know that you're earning more and you can afford it. While I'm not saying that you shouldn't enjoy your life and enjoy your hard work, keeping a lid on it is something that we need to do to a degree. There needs to be a hard cap in there somewhere, unless you're a billionaire, which none of us are. There'll be, there's very few people in the world who are billionaires and can afford to live this opulently lavish lifestyle that reaches a point where money is absolutely no object. If you let yourself progress down that route or that mindset, that way of thinking, you can spend as much money as you want and therefore there needs to be some sort of self-imposed limit. There's always going to be someone richer that you can show off to. There's always going to be the Smiths next door who will have something slightly nicer than you. you can always, you're always playing this arms race or this catch up unless you put this self-imposed risk limit in there somewhere. That is a hard thing to do. But of course, the more you can do that, the greater you can save rate, you can save money at, and the earlier you might reach this point of financial freedom. So first and foremost, saving money is the easiest way. Just looking at things, just maybe questioning things that do you need to spend X, Y, and Z on a really fancy car when it could be something a bit more practical but still look nice? It's possible, you know. I'm just trying to introduce this this extra layer of screening maybe into your thoughts that coronavirus has highlighted how important it is because the rug just got pulled just like that and we realized that maybe these sources of income that we took for granted they can go if we have the more of a cushion we have then the safer that will be a good rule of thumb is to have enough cash in the bank so that's available money that you can go six months without working i actually think 12 months would be even more of a cushion still. The more money you have, the more you can hold out and wait for that job that may be a more financially lucrative in the long run, rather than just accepting something that isn't very good in the short term. So in a way, it actually can be more economical for a few reasons to have that cushion of money rather than seen as something that is extra and unneeded. It's another way of thinking of it, which I think is quite nice. Debt is something that creeps into all our lives to a degree. There's good and bad kind of debt, bad kinds of debt. Now, I am, of course, not a financial advisor, so I can't advise everybody, generally speaking, what they might be the best, what might be the best approach to their individual lifestyle. But let's say, for example, that you have a credit card, you know that there's some silly amount of interest on your repayments, and that's eaten away not only the money that you have to repay, but it's increasing every month and it's compounding. That is an instance where debt is biting you very hard. And before any of us think of investing, 
a priority would be to get rid of that dangerous debt that is increasing every month well beyond the initial value of the of the amount you borrowed chipping away at your wealth it's only ever going to go one way it's only ever going to get one worse and this means that you have less capital subsequently to invest an example of a good kind of debt or a, a debt where you it's not as important to pay it back sooner would be a student loan where i believe the interest um, i can't quote exact figures but i know that the interest is quite low and that it does it only kicks in after you earn a certain amount well-meaning advice would be go something along the lines of pay off all your debts as quick as you can if the interest rate is very low it may be healthier to delay paying off the debt for as long as possible providing it's not dangerous debt providing it's not something that causes you to be liable to lose your house things along those lines so again something that you might want to think of and review on an individual basis person by person i can't give blanket advice but i do know that by and large if there is anything in your life that's causing you to lose lots of money every month and it's compounding because of interest, that is definitely something that we all want to get rid of. Fortunately, I personally don't have any major debts of that nature. If you do, definitely something to prioritise before you think about investing in any way, shape or form. Tax is something I have to say, I put my hand on my heart and I must confess, I did find it very boring i wouldn't say still it is something that exactly gets the juices flowing but when talking to mike bryan maybe i realized just how important it is that we all think about this i filled in my own tax return this year and now the thought of doing that almost makes me shudder through talking to mike it just real made me realize the numbers of ways that i could be more efficient with it i can save more money and therefore have more money to invest something that I think is super important and definitely something that I honestly you, you couldn't I couldn't really have cared less about it um, until not that long ago I suppose through seeing that it just made me realize the power of being smart with it being clever with it and how much more it can propel you towards your own financial goal whatever that might be retirement uh, financial freedom whatever etc etc you must consider as well we've talked about how to save money you must consider as well as part of your investment strategy how much time do you have to do this do you want to be an investor or do you want to be a trader a trader is something who dips in and out of the market every day they're constantly following the fluctuations of the stock market uh, crypto commodities whatever asset it is they choose to study which is fair enough but we will struggle with that ultimately as professionals we don't have that much time around doing what we're doing as someone who trades crypto let me tell you it does take a lot of time you need to follow what's going on almost every day and almost every day you're thinking of your trades you're plotting entries selling stuff buying stuff whatever which is fine um it depends on your trading style of course you can manage it around some styles you can manage a lot more around work than others when we talk about trading the ultimate strategy people want the holy grail of trading people want the indicator that tells you how to make unlimited amounts of money in the market the truth is that the best trading strategy is a strategy that works for you really interesting book i read a guy called van thorp interviews 50 traders each one of them have different strategies completely different strategies different indicators different measurements of the market different uh, strategies when they might dip in and out of the market every single one of them was successful every single one of them traded for a living and none of them had the same strategy what does that tell you it tells you that there's something more of it and it's more often than not their psychology it's their psychology and finding a strategy which suits you in terms of how much time you want to invest and your availability to stare at the screen not everyone is prepared to do that in which case you might be better off being an investor an investor is someone who in, who puts their money in the market buys long-term investments and maybe looks to many years or decades before they think about taking their money out for dentists this might be a little bit more of a suitable strategy you've heard me talk a little bit about this before in some of the other podcasts maybe some of you haven't again just another way of looking at your investment style your your long-term goals and i don't another thing that i learned through time was i always thought that you had to be actively doing it every day 
to be someone that invests your money by all means by no means whatsoever the the very lowest participation strategies involve you buying something maybe once a month with your paycheck and possibly rebalancing it maybe once or twice a year so that is to say just to buy and sell to re-level the percentages of each particular investment in your portfolio it is possible investing is something that it's it's okay to be okay at it's okay to be okay at no one not everyone has to be making 300 percent returns on their account every year well good good job if you do and fair play if you do manage to do that but by merely just having your money in some sort of index fund that's proven to beat inflation through time then you're already doing better than what it would be doing in your bank account particularly if you're buying that passive index fund and you're not spending that much time a year putting your money into it then to me putting putting your time into it sorry then to me that makes total sense just an interesting way of looking at it we have to bear in mind what the effects of inflation are going to be next year a lot of people think that because of the fact that interest rates have nowhere to go that there will likely be a lot of money printing let's not forget the central banks only really have two levers to affect how cash and credit works they can only reduce or increase interest rates interest rates are at zero so they can't generate any more money through lending they can't generate any more credit in society and therefore cash through lending so therefore their only other option if they want to buy themselves out of trouble is to create cash now inflation will only be an issue if they create too much cash so much cash that there is basically so much that it completely devalues what you have in your bank account and it outweighs how much credit there is available Let's not forget that there is two types of, how can I say, two types of currency, I suppose. So you have actual money, so that is the money that you and I have in your bank account, and we have credit. So credit is money that is either created by the bank or lent by the bank to individuals for whatever reason, to improve their business. It's been shown that in the American economy, 85% of what we think is cash is actually credit. If credit dries up, for whatever reason, the banks get nervous, they think there's going to be crash they think they won't get their money back then at that point printing cash can step in to compensate for that they have to get the balance right if there is very little money then that might be the only option that they have and it's at that point that inflation becomes runaway it's definitely not a guarantee that it will happen it's not as black and white as we print more money and therefore inflation occurs depends on a lot of things it depends on what other measures are taken by the government to reduce their debt a lot of those other measures are deflationary let's say for example they ask for their debts to be restructured then again banks get more nervous to lend money therefore there's less credit in society therefore people struggle to pay their debts even more and the cycle continues that's one example of a fact of a, of a uh, a, a method that it can be deflationary so they're very keen to not use those methods because they become a negative feedback cycle and they effectively drag the economy down further cash is something that you can use to proactively increase the amount of money in society and therefore keep the economy flowing it's only when this is overdone that it can become an issue and certainly if the government is out of options it is in their interest to inflate their debts away to nothing it's not a guarantee like i say uh it is possible however and it maybe highlights why it's not sensible for us to keep all of our money in cash and therefore hedge by buying other assets that may protect it ourselves an example of a good portfolio that you might want to use is first of all you have your monthly income you'll use some of that money to pay your outgoings and maintain your emergency cash balance of six to 12 months. After that, you have your invested capital, whatever that might be. So let's talk about what you might do with your invested capital. And here is an example of a method that I use and that I think is quite safe. So you have 100% of your total invested capital, the money that's left over after you've paid your outgoings and maintained your emergency fund, as I say. You might decide to keep 20-30% of that in cash. You might like to put uh, 10 or 20% of that in 
gold, you might like to put some of that in stocks, some of that in bonds, some of that in Bitcoin, whatever you're into. All I'm saying is that it's important to think about these things should inflation become an issue next year. Fingers crossed it won't. There are some conditions that would make that likely to occur that have come about because of economic strife heralded by the coronavirus. Again, interesting stuff. You've probably heard that in my other podcasts, but if you haven't, definitely a novel way of looking at things and protecting yourself. If anybody would like a great book on the matter who is UK based, then you may like to think about How to Own the World by Andrew Craig. It's a great book on the subject. And then The Gone Fishing Portfolio, in addition to that, which tells you exactly how to design a long-term portfolio for investing. And this is not about going out there and risking money this is about protecting yourself this is about hedging your bets about against what may occur in the long run keeping your money in a roundabout way if you kind of think about it keeping all of your money in cash is actually less safe than thinking about buying some indexes thinking about buying some gold stuff along those lines because of inflation you may argue not everyone will agree with me on that. That would certainly be my views. And that would be with the caveat, of course, that you know what you're doing with your money. I suppose when you thought about what you'd like to achieve and you thought about the means of which you're going to achieve it and through and saving money, as we've just touched upon, you might like to look at your goals and how you might want to get to those goals specifically. Diversifying is very important, so that means holding a little bit of various different things. You can mix and match that as you want. There's some ways that are better than others. I don't think that anybody should be over leveraged, so that means have most of your money in one asset. There was a once a time in my life a couple of years ago where I just liked to have as much as I could in cash. If I could go back now, I'd uh, definitely give myself a good slap around the face uh, because I've seen the merits or the the merits of investing and maybe why it's so inadvisable to keep it all in cash. There is the age old argument of whether you should hire an IFA or DIY. Once upon a time I was very regimented, very restricted in my views and I always thought that a DIY portfolio uh, of buying your own stocks and bonds was vastly more advantageous than having an IFA there is a lot of if you're looking at it purely in terms of economics and you know what you're doing you can save a fair bit of money over the long run even if the IFA's fees only are maybe one to two percent not everybody will be comfortable with investing their own money some people like the security that's totally fine as well in which case an IFA might be more suitable for you and you would prefer to outsource the obligation to somebody else What I will say is an interesting fact that's often thrown around is that if you look at passive funds versus active funds, so that is funds that purely mirror a large index, which are totally autonomous and have nobody running them, versus people who are, well, funds, sorry, that are actively traded by an individual who will buy and sell shares on your behalf should you invest in it. It's very difficult for those people to beat the market because of their fees that they charge. You might know that 93% of passive funds, 93% of the time, active funds are beaten by passive funds in the States. In the USA, that is true. In the UK, Luke Hurley actually recently told me that the stats are a little different in the UK. It's actually more like 75% of active funds Uh, struggle to beat passive funds such as the FTSE 100. Just something to bear in mind and maybe that if you were to do a little bit of reading around the subject of managing your own finances, managing your own investment portfolio, you'll see that there are some inherent advantages that you have over somebody else who is managing it on your behalf. When things are going well, if you do start investing your money when things are going well, it's easy to get carried away and easy to think you're Warren Buffett these things are not about being right or wrong there is obviously an element of chance in there to a degree it's important to not let any any 
times or instances that you're doing well in the market go to your head. This can make you think that you're bulletproof, that you're solid gold and anything that you touch will continue to do well. This can lead to in risky investment strategies, investing in things that aren't necessarily sensible. It's best to keep a structure to it. It's happened too many times where people get carried away with their own success and then they believe themselves to be better than what they actually are. Bear in mind, the market is so complicated that nobody can predict it 100%. Even the biggest maths whiz kid in the whole world or someone who knows everything about a particular asset can never predict exactly where it's gonna go. There's too much information. Therefore, there's always that element of chance and it's always best to be humble. Dollar cost averaging is such a good strategy because it takes all of the psychology that I've just spoke of out of the game. You buy a little bit every month. You don't ever deviate from that, whether it's going up or down. And because you're taking advantage of averaging out your entry through time, that means you can remove most of the onerous task of analyzing it yourselves. This is why it's so easy. It's so easy and useful and accessible to most people. It means that you don't have to envelop yourself in reading loads of books and materials and spending time meticulously studying things, which you may, given even if you know every what every single book on the matter says on a specific subject on technical analysis, you still will will get it wrong because as I say, there's just too much information out there for any one person to get their head around. That's why dollar cost averaging is so useful and something that you might find easy to implement into your long-term investing strategy. The most important thing is to stay in the game. When I say stay in the game is what I mean is not have all your money in one stock, not have all your money in one commodity, whatever. Yes, that may come off. The biggest gains occur infrequently. However, I'll say that again, the biggest gains occur infrequently. You may get lucky, but chances are you won't because it's infrequent that that sort of thing happens. If you're out of the game, i.e. you lose all your investment capital, it's gone for good. And those amazing opportunities that do come along with time, you won't have the capital to capitalize on them. So it's always best to manage your risk, not have too much money in any one thing. And just always be conscious of that, even if it looks like the most surefire bet in the world, the number of ridiculous reasons why companies fail that are completely unforeseen. Well, no one can ever see no one can ever see those sorts of things coming and therefore it's always best to hedge and never have everything all in one asset. Remember that the S P has increased ten percent year on year since nineteen fifty seven. That is something that we can easily, easily have a stake in through most cap, most stocks and shares ISAs. Something to think about. I'm not saying it's as simple as that. Will that change in the future? Maybe, who's to say? Again, we don't wanna put everything into one asset. Just a healthy thing to think about and something that definitely flipped how I looked at money and investing on its head whenever I began this journey initially. You know those things you'll know that investing doesn't have to be as complicated as everybody makes it out to be. It's okay to be okay at it. Which kind of turns on its head the received knowledge that you have to spend a lot of time analyzing charts and looking at the computer. I hope that those things have helped. These Some of those are things that I knew before. Some of these are things that I've been saying for years. And some of those are things that I've learned from having conversations through this podcast that are definitely useful to hear once more. Let's put the investing aside for a moment. On a more personal note, the power of social media is something that's really blowing me away. Um, I definitely really didn't fully appreciate it until I started the group, started the podcast, all of the rest. And from the point of view of just how much it's enhanced my life and how much I enjoy doing it, I really think that it's something that maybe a lot of people who, like myself, are maybe not really conscious of and it really has just I've learned an absolute ton I think a lot of people have benefited from it it's been so much fun so far I would encourage anybody else out there who does have a passion or something that they're interested in to really think about creating some sort of community whether that be in dentistry whether that be uh, outside of dentistry there is always more space for 
groups on Facebook for com communities of people who are interested in something that's 100% worthwhile and I definitely think a lot of people stand to gain from it. From the point of view of just maybe like myself, it's just giving you a new lease on life. Worth thinking about 100%. I've made so many friends. Uh, I would like to think that I've helped some people by undertaking this as well. This year has saw me commit to being a dedicated lifelong reader. This is something that I have always I've always tried to read throughout my life, uh, but to put things into context before before uh, a few months ago, before lockdown, the book that I was reading, I'd been reading it for about six months. I definitely didn't dedicate anywhere near as much time as to as what I dedicate to it now. It's a complete life hack. You'll learn so much, so much more things that you can teach others, so many more things that you can enact in your own life from brilliant books. If you think about what a book is, it's the distilled knowledge on a particular subject of an expert in that field. It's the result of a culmination of, even in some instances, a lifetime's worth of effort placed in something that you can access and use. When you think about it in those sorts of terms, you know, you'll, re you'll realize that you could devote your life to studying this particular subject and probably wind up roughly with the knowledge that's contained in this book. So it's a shortcut to achieving that. And when someone has devoted that much of their life to learning about one particular thing or studying it, there usually is a lot that you can pick up from them. Complete life hack. I definitely wish, I mean, I always was interested in books, but I definitely wish that I'd been a lot more dedicated to it than I had done before. Those would be the greatest, some of the greatest things that I've learned this year. I think as well as that, another really convenient method of learning a lot of things is podcasts, something that I've never really been aware of too much. The fact that you can just put them on wherever you fancy. You can be at the gym, you can be driving somewhere, and you can learn quite a lot through doing this is something that I've become a lot more switched on to, a lot more in tune about. And certainly if there was no such thing as podcasts, then I wouldn't have been able to start mine as well. So grateful to them on that front too. I actually have to say, I don't think I'd listened to a podcast in years until I went on Jazz's podcast. That was the that was the first one that got me thinking. It was a little while ago when the group was just getting up and running. And it made me realize that actually they're quite a useful method that's accessible to a lot of people to getting your message across. They're very versatile and they're interesting and they're convenient. 100% I'm going to endeavor to listen to more in the new year. I listen to crypto podcasts almost every day where I'm, when I'm in the gym, when I'm in a car going somewhere. Really, really worthwhile, 100% useful. And I wish someone would have told me that a lot, a lot sooner. So in essence, what I'm saying is if you have a passion, definitely put yourself out there. You probably like me, you'll never really realize just how many good things can come of it until you at least try. And as well as that, I'm gonna make every conscious effort of every of every spare hour of every day to learn things. Apparently the average CEO reads 20 books in a year. So that's your benchmark to go on. If you can read 20 books in a year, then you're comparable to the average CEO. I said that I talk a little bit about Bitcoin at the very start of this podcast. What an amazing few weeks it's been for Bitcoin. We've seen the price rally from rough, roughly, well, just less than $20,000 to about twenty-seven or twenty-eight as of yesterday, which is amazing. I mean, that's a 50% increase in value if you would have invested not that long ago. Most people who've ever bought Bitcoin have made profit at this stage. There is a few interesting narratives about why it's kicking off at this point. It's really difficult to pinpoint it down to one. One would be the decrease in supply. Two would be the macro conditions of money printing. Three would be the fact that a lot of large companies are now getting involved with it, hoarding it. Most people, because they realize that the price is going up, aren't selling as well. Therefore, that's only going to increase 
demand to therefore driving the price up it's really difficult to pinpoint it down to one particular thing what i will say is that historically when bitcoin broke its all-time high as it did a few weeks ago just as i said when it went past twenty thousand dollars it continues to rally for a year afterwards last time it did this was january 2017 uh it stopped doing so at the end of december 2017 i think off the top of my head the date was 17th of december uh when it hit its previous all-time high before it did again a few weeks ago so that gave it roughly a year to increase in price it increased in price by 20 times it was a thousand dollars and then it went to twenty thousand dollars furthermore the time before it did that was uh well it was in 2016 i believe 2015 2016 and it increased 10 times in price so will it increase 10 times in price again this year i don't think it's unreasonable to say that i think that it might wind up being between 100,000 200,000 it could be more it could be less i don't know all i'm saying is that if we go on historical trends it shall and can continue to increase and increase that's having said that there's no guarantee that it will continue to do so uh but if we can't base what we expect to happen on the past then what do we have to base any prediction on really that's our template i suppose um it's not for everybody you know definitely not I'm really hoping that the altcoins are going to do well. So those are cryptos that are anything but Bitcoin for people who are interested or didn't know that already. They're known collectively as altcoins. So you may have heard of Ethereum, Ripple, XRP. Those are complementary to Bitcoin in that when Bitcoin rises, their value tends to go down. Apart from when it breaks its all time high, in which case the whole market rallies, as we've seen in the last few weeks, when Bitcoin stalls, Hopefully, altcoins are going to play catch up over the next few weeks. I'm actually 100% in altcoins in my trading account at the minute. Uh, therefore, I'm a little bit biased. I'm I'm rooting for those. I believe it's hit the point where Bitcoin's market dominance is unsustainable. It's very very high at the minute. I think it's 70% of the market roughly. We've seen it flutter. We've seen it falter in the last few days. Hopefully, that's going to continue to go down, and I will be putting my profits. From my altcoins into bitcoin but anyway that's just my strategy just an interesting one for you if you're probably 90 percent of people who trade altcoins trade crypt the crypto space is more profitable for them just to buy bitcoin in the first place it's actually quite hard to beat the market you have to be very you have to analyze it all day every day it's difficult to do and therefore that's why i think bitcoin definitely makes a good investment in my eyes as I say, it's not for everybody, but if we do go on past trends, it's certainly looking like it's an interesting time and it's picking up. Trend will of course not last forever as we have seen in previous years. When it will end and how it will end, it is very difficult to say. All I will say is that when we look at past trends, it looks like it's just beginning. It usually continues for a year after Bitcoin breaks its all time high, as I said earlier. I'd just like to round off by saying thank you very much to everybody who listens to this podcast. Thanks to everybody on the group. It's been so much fun. The reason why I set it up was to help dentists so that we understand a lot more about finance, how to protect ourselves and what we can do, what we can achieve when we put our mind to it in the long run through investing wisely. There is very little unbiased information out there. The group is an attempt to counteract that and I don't think there ever was anything like that before. Hopefully we're achieving our objectives. I hope that everybody has had a wonderful Christmas, uh, spend some time with family, some time to reflect on what's been a crazy year. Fingers crossed we're going to be out of the out of the tunnel, out of the woods with this vaccine. Time will tell on that one. I'm optimistic. I think it's going to be probable. I would really love for things to go back to being normal <laughs> i don't know whether that will happen there will likely be a new normal which i hope very much that will resemble as much as possible the old one again time will tell i think it's going to be a little while yet before we get there but nonetheless we'll batten down the hatches we'll pull through i'm sure we'll be fine ultimately at the end of the day happy new year to everybody happy christmas and i shall speak to you all very soon